All right. Um, reading is something that, generally speaking, it's a way, a very powerful tool. We know that um, the development of reading and writing really kind of vaulted civilization on a path of increasing complexity. And here we are today in a very complex society. Imagine being without the skill of, of reading and writing. It's really one of the most important things <clears throat> that web us together. I mean, we've come a long way since the Egyptian and Mesopotamians have developed this. But information technology today, although operating on binary code, the same way we interface um, information on the Internet, on a web page, is the same way the Egyptians uh, communicated ideas. That is the use of symbols to convey meaning and ideas. Well, here's what we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to be doing some reading, and obviously that's not a surprise. History oftentimes does that. But I want to try to help us unlock some keys and some tools to help us become more effective and more efficient readers. A lot of times students develop some kind of lazy habits and, and don't develop the tools of effective reading. And they'll skim to try to find answers to a question because reading is generally seen as an assignment. It's something you have to do and have to get through. Yet, many of us read on our own for particular purposes. Like, for example, pick up the sports page and you want to read about how the Cleveland Browns did. And as you do that, you're not assigned to doing this. And you think, well, I'm interested in what the Browns are doing. And you know a little bit about the background of the team, what they did last week, and what football is all about. And without much thought, you unwittingly unlock all this prior information or background about the Browns. And you interject that as you read. What you've done is you've made your brain ready for the new information. So as you read the article, you retain an awful lot of what you've read because it's essentially you've prepared your brain for new information. You've accessed hooks in your brain so that the new information can join prior information. You can do the same with history, even if it's not your favorite subject. Um, and of course, we're all going to be reading in the future. And to be more effective readers, we can do something to discipline our brains to prepare for what we have to do to have a purpose. We're going to do something called SQ3R, which is a way to approach reading, to first to scan it, to get an idea of what you're reading, to set a purpose, or, you know, so you have um, a question, the purpose of reading, why are you reading it? And it's not just to get it done. That, of course, if you get it done and that's your purpose, then you will get it done, but you won't learn much. If you have clear ideas of what you will be learning about, you'll prepare your brain, just like you'd prepare, um, a room for new furniture. You would have spaces for places so you don't just pile it. You want to be able to find things when you need it. And your brain is how do you access information when you need it? Well, you have to have a place to put it. So SQ3R will help you do that. So I'm guaranteeing you folks, if you take your time and really learn how to become a disciplined reader, then quizzes and tests that based on reading will be a lot easier to do than having to jump back and forth and do it piecemeal. So and SQ3, the first thing is the scan, and here's our reading for today. The reading is also posted. It's called the European Middle Ages. So I want to scan it first, and that's something that should take you maybe two or three minutes to do, but it's very well worth it. So I look at the title, the European Middle Ages, 500 to 1200. I'm thinking, well, we talked about that yesterday, what the Middle Ages were. And I, the overview might be a good to kind of give us a big picture, so I'll read that in full. German peoples invading the Roman Empire caused it to fall. Oh, we know that. We just studied that. Small Germanic kingdoms arose. The kingdoms of Charlemagne finally united, reunited Western Europe, but split apart after his death. As different groups invaded Europe, people sought protection and gave up some rights to powerful lords, producing a system called feudalism. The church proved an important spiritual and political force through the Middle Ages. So those are some of the things we talked about in yesterday's lecture to keep that in mind. So we have uh, Charlemagne unites the Germanic kingdoms. Um, many Germanic kingdoms that succeeded the Roman Empire were united after Charlemagne. And then we have a section there on feudalism in Europe. The key idea is uh, feudalism, uh, political military system, and protective alliance and relationships develops in Europe. So you think what we talked about with spice, that's going to be a, a, a political system creating order. Then we have the age of chivalry. A Code of Chivalry for Knights Glorified Combat and Romantic Love. You may have studied knights. Um, we just watched The Knight's Tale a week or two ago um, at home. It's a fun movie if you want to watch it, but we have some idea what knights are. And, and then we have the power of the church. The church leaders and political leaders competed for power and authority. 
Now, there's some questions at the bottom. Now, generally speaking, those are questions that oftentimes get assigned. But even if we don't assign the questions, being aware of them is a good way to make things stick. So what were the effects of the arrival of the Germans in the fall of the Roman Empire? Why was Charlemagne important? Did his achievements last long? When we looked at Charlemagne, as mentioned at the beginning of this reading. How did invasions contribute to the beginning of feudal system? Um, what were the position of women during the Middle Ages? And how important do you think the church was in the Middle Ages and why? So those are some things we'll be looking at. So we've scanned this. So we need to come up with a purpose. What are we going to learn about? It looks like we're going to be looking at it from 500 to 1200 CE, about the Roman Middle Ages. We're going to learn a bit about how the Middle Ages were organized, what the Middle Ages were in Europe's history, and how they managed to keep a society together. We've already talked about how it was a difficult time in, Europe, in Western civilization. It was somewhat of a step backward, particularly in the early period called the Dark Ages. So we're accessing prior information. So that would be the questioning. We've scanned it. Now we have a question, a question what we're going to answer. We're going to understand how did early Middle Ages organize? How did the early Middle Ages create a society that would succeed Rome? So that's what we're going to be looking at. So, so the next issue is we need to read. And what we want to do, the key to reading here is reading in full grammatical sequence. At the end of every paragraph or two, we should step back and say, what did we learn? How does this connect to the reading? If there was a paragraph in there that was totally irrelevant to the, to the purpose of the reading, would you catch it? Or are you just looking at words? The difference between just looking at words where information just kind of rolls off and having a story or access or purpose is a way to really connect to, to your reading in a meaningful way. So let's look at the first paragraph. This is under Charlemagne Unites the Germanic Kingdoms. By the end of the... Okay, so here we go on the first paragraph. By the end of the fourth century, invaders from many different Germanic groups overran the Roman Empire in the West. Their arrival and the collapse of Roman rule had several effects. The attacks put a halt to all trade as it was not safe to move goods from one place to another. The end of Roman government and the decline in trade made cities less important. As cities faded, nobles moved to the countryside. Poor people followed, hoping to be able to grow their own food. The general level of education in society became lower. As Germanic people settled in different areas, they began to blend Latin with phrases of their own. Their language developed into different dialects. Europe no longer had a single language understood by all. So if you look at that, just reflect for a second, connect it. We've already talked about how the early Middle Ages were a dark age, and we could see that the collapse of Rome kind of left Europe in, in desperate measure. So if you take just a, a couple seconds after each paragraph and kind of recite what you learn, it's going to connect and it's going to stick with you more. From about 400 to 600, um, Europe was in a scene of turmoil and chaos, and small Germanic kingdoms fought each other for power. Long-held Roman ideals about law were replaced by Germanic ideals of society based on close personal ties. The Catholic Church provided the only sense of order. In 496 CE, uh, Clovis, the king of the Franks, became a Christian with all of his warriors. From then on, the Pope and Rome supported the military efforts of Clovis. Clovis was one of the many leaders to become Christian. The Church made an effort to bring these people into the religion. It also set up new communities called monasteries, where men called monks and women called nuns um, lived lives devoted to God. These monasteries became important because their libraries preserved some writings of the ancient world. Again, we talk, if you connect that to what we've already looked at, too, is that the church was the important glue kind of holding uh, medieval or middle age society together um, through the chaos. So you take a moment between each paragraph and just briefly discuss how it connects. Let's do one or two more paragraphs here together, or let's do this whole first section together, and then you could model this for the rest on your own. Um, the church grew in importance when Gregory I became Pope in 590. He made the Pope the guardian of all spiritual lives of all Christians. He also made the Pope an important power in governing parts of Italy. The kingdom of the Franks covered much of modern France, by the 700s, the most important official was the mayor of the palace, even more powerful than the king. He made laws and controlled the army. In 719, 
Charles Martel became mayor and expanded the lands controlled by the Franks. He also won a battle in 732 against the Muslim forces moving north from Spain. That ended the Muslim threat in Europe and made Martel a Christian hero. His son Pepin was crowned king. One of Pepin's sons, Charlemagne, became king of the land of the Franks in 771. At six feet four inches tall, Charlemagne towered over most people of his time. With military skill, he expanded his kingdom to make it larger than any known since Rome. By 800, he made most of modern Italy and all of modern France and parts of modern Spain and Germany. Um, Pope Leo crowned him emperor. With that, the power of the church and the Germanic kings joined the heritage of the old Roman Empire. Do you recall, we saw a picture of Charlemagne yesterday in our presentation. You know, we talked about how Charlemagne attempted to try to recreate this idea of a Holy Roman Empire. Again, um, made crowned by the Pope, Pope Leo III. Charlemagne cut the power of the nobles and his empire increased his own. He traveled throughout his lands, visiting the people and judging cases. He brought well-read men into his court and sponsored a revival of learning. However, Charlemagne's empire broke into pieces soon after his death. So in this section, we kind of looked at how that after the decline of Rome, um, Europe was left kind of in turmoil, that the church led by the Pope created some kind of a glue, but the German societies were based more on personal loyalty than the more abstract ideas that the Romans had about law. And we see that, that the Franks kind of emerged as the most powerful Germanic group, um, they accepted Christianity, creating a blend between the church and the state that kind of held together for a couple of centuries. And that a few centuries later, Charlemagne um, becomes the king of the Franks and eventually is crowned as the Holy Roman Emperor, trying to reestablish Roman order. But after his death, his empire would break into pieces. Okay, so you have a couple more sections to look at here, and you want to do the same thing. Stop every couple of paragraphs, connect what you have, so that you could be effective in doing the um, taking a quiz when we're done here. So please carefully read through the rest of the section and then take the quiz that is at the end. If we have a problem with the quiz, we may have to go back to some outlining or writing because I want to make sure that we're not just answering questions, but we're accountable for the content. Okay, folks, good luck with this.